Hello, Mark here. Before we begin today's episode, I would just like to quickly take the time to ask all of those who are enjoying the series a favour. If the platform you use to listen to Castings for Ancient Greece has a rating or review system, I would be extremely grateful if you would consider leaving the series a quick review. These ratings and reviews go a long way into helping others discover the show, in turn helping it grow. So if you enjoy the series and can spare a few minutes, I would love to read what you have to say about your experiences with the show. Thanks everyone for your support, and let's get to today's episode. Almost immediately afterwards, it happened that there was another dispute between Athens and the Peloponnese. This also contributed to the breaking out of the war. It concerned the people of Potidaea, who lived on the Isthmus of Pallene, and who, though colonists of Corinth, were allies of Athens in the tribute-paying class. Thucydides Hello, I'm Mark Selleck and welcome back to Casting Through Ancient Greece, Episode 70, War is in the Air. We are now at a point where we can see the path towards the Peloponnesian War being laid. For us though, we get to understand these events with hindsight, knowing what was at the end of this path. Having said that, it has been interesting to see how this war would come from the regional dispute around the polis of Epidamnus, also known as the Epidamnus Affair. This would initially see a dispute develop between the islands of Cosyra and Corinth, as Epidamnus was attempting to deal with the civil strife that had set in. Both Cosyra and Corinth had been involved in the foundation of Epidamnus in some way, and the colony was looking for help from its founders. Initially, Corsara did not want to assist, but after Corinth had been approached and agreed to help, Corsara saw Corinth attempting to exert its influence near the Epidamnus at their expense. This would end up seeing conflict develop between the two polis, where a naval engagement would be fought and Corinth decisively beaten. Instead of this resolving the issue, it would now escalate with Corinth wanting to gain revenge for their defeat. They would now prepare to ramp up their efforts, where they would assemble a large group of settlers in an attempt to refound Epidamnus in their own right. The build-up of forces from within Corinth, the Allies and the other cities would go on for two years, where in the meantime they looked to protect the interests along the Adriatic with defensive operations. Kassara, who had thought they had called Corinth's bluff, were now becoming very concerned at these very aggressive moves. Attempts had been made to try and resolve the matter diplomatically, though this would fail and Kassara would go in search of a powerful ally. This powerful ally was Athens, and both Kassara and Corinth would send delegates to put their cases forward. Kassara looking to form an alliance with Athens, while Corinth looked to keep them out of the conflict. After both sides had put their cases forward, and Athens was left to debate the matter over two assemblies, it would be decided to help Kassara out. This assistance, however, was only in the form of a defensive alliance, Athens attempting to not breach the Thirty Years' Peace. A large factor in Athens coming to this decision seems to be wrapped up in the future control of the seas, Corinth and Kassara having their largest fleets after Athens. However, this had not deterred Corinth, and they sailed north, where they would establish camp on the mainland across from the waters of Kassara. The Battle of Sabota would be fought at sea between the two sides, where ten Athenian ships would also be part of the Kassarian battle line. We would witness yet another escalation in the path to a larger conflict, when the Athenian ships would engage the Corinthian ones in battle, when it looked as though Kassara would break. The battle would result in a somewhat indecisive result, with both fleets intact. Though, Corinth would sail home with questions around the status between themselves and Athens. This episode will be continuing on with developments as they would unfold. This time around though, we'll be moving our focus away from the western areas and turning to mainland Greece and the Chalcidides. Here we'll see Athens aware that a potential larger war was at hand and needed to prepare for it. Part of these preparations would see them focus on two polis that would have connections to the Peloponnesian League and direct connections to Corinth. This would see the actions undertaken further inflaming tensions with a sense of war in the air. After the Athenian fleet had returned home from Kassara, they brought back with them news of what had taken place during their expedition. Of particular concern would have been the actions that had occurred at the Battle of Sabota, where Athenian and Corinthian ships had engaged in combat. This had led to some confusion around the relationship between Athens and Corinth the day after the battle. The Athenian commanders would try to step back from the actions that could well be interpreted as a breach of the Thirty Years' Peace. They would deny that a state of war now existed between the two, and would allow the Corinthians to sail away if they did not sail against Kassara. 
It appears here that the emotions of battle had seen the Athenians overstep the mark, though since they are watching what appeared to be the rout of the Kosirian fleet. The next day, however, they would have been able to take stock of the situation with cooler heads, and act more in line with the instructions given to them before their departure. Now though, back in Athens, the full ramifications of what had unfolded at Sabota and on the Corinthians' return home would be clear to Pericles and others. Perhaps what Thucydides presents in his history of the Peloponnesian War captures what these men were thinking. After all, Thucydides lived through these times. He writes, So Corsara remained undefeated in her war with Corinth, and the Athenian fleet left the island. But this gave Corinth her first cause for war against Athens. The reason being that Athens had fought against her with Corsara, although the peace treaty was still in force. It was now that it appears it was realised that war with Corinth was very likely, and Athens would prepare accordingly. However, even though it was deemed likely that a war with Corinth was coming, Athens would attempt to try and approach this conflict without involving Sparta, and attempt not to technically breach the Thirty Years' Peace. The first steps taken would be to ensure that Athens would have the financial resources free to deal with the conflict if it did come. Inscriptions survive today of two decrees offered by Callias that had both been passed by the Athenian assembly. Both of these relate to the reorganisation of the city's finances, where what follows I have taken from the translations that Donald Kagan provides in his outbreak of the Peloponnesian War. The first reads, Since 3,000 talents have been paid to Athena on the Acropolis, the debts owed to the other gods should now be paid. The funds so accumulated should be administered by a new board of treasurers, like those of the treasury of Athena, and kept likewise on the Acropolis, any surplus should be used for the dockyards and walls. The second decree reads, Certain golden statues of Nike and the gateway to the Acropolis, the Propylia, were to be completed, but after that, no sum exceeding 10,000 drachmas should be spent without a previous special vote of sanction in the assembly. So here we can see Athens was looking to make good on their obligations with their current surplus, while also looking at not taking on additional building projects for the time being. This would then see to it that additional funds could be directed at the fleet while then building up the treasury to prepare for the coming war. However, these were not the only measures that Athens would take. They would also act geopolitically in an attempt to strengthen their position in any coming war. The main actions that we are going to focus on, and that would seem to have the largest direct impact on tensions being raised further, would be directed at Potidaea and Megara. Potidaea was up on the Chalcidides, where Athens had been strengthening its position against Thracian and Macedonian influence there. Originally, it had begun as a Corinthian colony, being founded somewhere around 600 BC. Corinth still held influence within the city, and would send a supreme magistrate there each year. Though now with the war between Athens and Corinth seeming likely, Athens was looking to protect their interests in the Chalcidides, and would attempt to neutralise any threat Corinth could produce there. Megara, as we have seen, became part of the Peloponnesian League after the First Peloponnesian War. This had been a vitally important location for both Athens and Sparta, as it guarded the exit from the Corinthian Isthmus into Attica. This had been an issue through the First Peloponnesian War, but now with it part of the Peloponnesian League, Athens looked to weaken its position and reduce the effect it would have when Athens would need to enact their defensive strategy. However, Athens' activities around both of these regions would further inflame tensions and would ultimately lead to diplomatic talks that would result in a larger Greek war being declared, this being the Peloponnesian War. Though, was it these actions by Athens that would result in the declaration of war, or was this conflict always going to take shape in this current climate? Hopefully, we'll be able to answer this question over the next couple of episodes. But let's now turn to looking at the actions around Potidaea and Megara in more detail. So we'll first turn to Potidaea and the actions taking place there. Here we have a few elements at play that would somewhat complicate matters. We already mentioned that Potidaea began as a Corinthian colony and still retained some Corinthian connections. Even though they still had this connection, they were also a tribute paying member to Athens. On top of this, Potidaea, located in the Chalcidides, was within reach of Macedonian influence and at this stage, Macedon, now ruled by King Perdiccas, was hostile towards Athens. This had come about since Athens had supported his brother Philip with an alliance who was in opposition to him. Potidaea for Athens was an important city, as it was their main port that was used to access the Chalcidides and the wider region. This had given Athens greater access to timber and the precious metal mines in the area. We had seen around the time of the Samian Revolt, Athens had made a big push in this area to make it more secure. Now though, it appears that they were concerned that Corinthian or Macedonian influence would see the city revolt against them threatening their connection to the region. 
If war were to come, this would be a big loss since the resources from this region would be greatly missed. Plus, this would put other Athenian-controlled cities in the region under greater threat. Athens would now take measures to see that they would be the only ones that Potidaea could turn to. They would send orders that the walls should be destroyed, this removing the Potidaeans' ability to defend effectively if revolt did break out. They also demanded that the Corinthian magistrates within the city should be expelled, and that they were not to receive anyone else from Corinth, this severing their ties to the Corinthians. On top of this, Athens wanted hostages to be sent to Athens, this being a common practice when agreements or treaties were made to ensure adherence to the measures. It appears this order had gone out ahead with an Athenian delegate, though a force was in the process of departing Athens on a mission directed at Macedonian lands, where they were to assist Philip, Perdiccas's brother, in combating him. This force was also then given the additional instructions to ensure that the demands that had been made were carried out, while they were to remain vigilant for rebellions in the surrounding cities. Though, between the orders given to Potidaea and the Athenian forces being sent, Potidaea turned to diplomatic measures to attempt to counter these orders. Firstly, a delegation would arrive in Athens in an attempt to not see any additional requests made of them. It must be noted that it appears the tribute payment Potidaea made to Athens had recently increased significantly. The Athenian tribute list indicates that they had consistently paid six talents, though there were indications in 434-433 they may have attempted some sort of resistance, as no figure is recorded that year. Then, following this, the next year, they are listed as paying 15 talents. There are no other details around what was happening here, so we are left to interpret matters ourselves. Though, it being quite possible, Athens' fears were justified as measures for rebellion had already begun. Maybe this Athenian force we hear about with a mission to Macedonian lands was a response to Perdiccas' interfering in Potidaea. This just being a thought I had based on what we hear taking place through Thucydides. Anyway, I digress. Back to Potidaea's response. In addition to sending an envoy to Athens, it appears they also prepared for those talks not going the way they wished. A delegation had also been sent to Sparta that was accompanied by Corinthian representatives. They had already received Corinthian support and would now gain a promise from Sparta that they would invade Attica if Athens would attack their city. It appears Athens would delay their talks with the Potidaeans, or at least would string them along before ignoring their pleas. Thucydides says here that the Potidaeans were unable to obtain anything satisfactory from the Athenians after prolonged negotiations. So with nothing coming from their talks with Athens and support from both Corinth and Sparta, Potidaea decided to resist Athenian orders. This would see Potidaea revolt from Athens as a tribute paying member of their empire. Though they would not be the only ones, it appears some talks in the background involving Perdiccas and the Greeks were taking place before the envoys were sent by Potidaea. Thucydides telling us here, In his, this being Perdiccas, alarm he sent to Sparta to try and involve the Athenians in a war with the Peloponnesians and was endeavouring to win over Corinth in order to bring about the revolt of Potidaea. He also made overtures to the Chalcidians in Thrace and to the Boeotians to persuade them to join in the revolt, for he thought that if these places on the borders could be made his allies, it would be easier to carry on the war with their cooperation. This is basically what would take place. Potidaea would rebel and enter into a league with the other Chalcidian cities and Boeotian ones, effectively seeing a larger revolt form. Just to point out here, Boeotus was a region that neighboured the Chalcidians. Perdiccas would back these cities and would offer land within his territory to the Chalcidian cities on the coast if they would follow his advice. This would be around Lake Bulby, where the Chalcidians moved into the Macedonian territory. He instructed them to demolish their walls and abandon their cities then establish themselves at Olympus, just inland. This would see all the cities come together in establishing a stronger position to oppose the Athenians. Athens would then not be able to take advantage of their powerful fleet in attempting to reduce the revolting cities. So it would seem that the Athenians had underestimated Potidaea and their obedience to them. They had sent instructions ahead of the city to comply with, but no one enforced them. It wasn't until later where Athens would give a fleet heading out with another mission to basically check in on them and make sure all was in order. However, this force would not be sufficient to deal with what awaited them, this further pointing to Pericles' misjudgment of the situation up north. It's thought that this Athenian fleet probably left port in spring of 432, it consisting of 30 triremes, a thousand hoplites, and would be commanded by Archistratus, who was accompanied by four other generals. By the time the fleet reached the Thracian coast, they discovered Potidaea, along with much of the region, was already in revolt. Archistratus, 
along with his other generals, discussed how they should proceed, since they found matters quite different to what they would have been told. They would decide that the initial mission they had been given to assist Philip would now be followed. They had deemed that the forces they had arrived with were far too small to deal with a revolt that had broken out. Though before the fleet had continued on with their original mission, a messenger would have been sent back to Athens to report what was unfolding in Potidaea and the surrounding area. This now put Pericles in a position that he had avoided. He expected Potidaea to act reasonably. After all, they had already paid their 15 talents to the treasury for that year. If they were going to revolt, one would expect that they would have done before paying. Pericles would now have to send a dedicated force out to deal with enforcing Athens' wishes, but now their task was made much more difficult due to the revolt already taking place. Back in Corinth, news of Potidaea revolting at Athens and the arrival of the Athenian fleet had travelled back to them. They would now arrange assistance for their colony. However, they were still attempting to act in a way that would not breach the Thirty Years' Peace. To do this, they would not send an official Corinthian fleet, but would call for volunteers and obtain mercenaries from other areas of the Peloponnese. The drive for volunteers would be quite successful, as a man that would lead the expedition, Aristus, son of Andymantus, was very popular in Corinth, so many Corinthians would sign up after learning he would be commanding. It was Aristus's father, Adimantus, we saw had commanded the Corinthians during the Persian invasion. This recruiting campaign would see that 1600 hoplites and 4000 light troops, not part of a Corinthian force, but a volunteer one, would be ready to sail and lend aid to Potidaea. Pericles would learn of the Corinthian response to the revolt and the initial Athenian fleet, so he would assemble and set the second force off as soon as he could. This fleet would be commanded by Callias, who would have at his disposal 40 triremes and 2,000 hoplites. When Callias' force arrived, they had found that the original Athenian expedition had taken the city of Theme and were now laying siege to Pydna, both further north of Potidaea and in Macedonian territory. Archistratus had been carrying out these operations in support of Philip and had not been engaged in the revolt on the Chalcidides. Callias would initially join up with the besieging forces for a while, where then Thucydides tells us they came to terms and conducted a forced alliance with Perdiccas. However, as Donald Kagan suggests here, it seems likely that Pericles was aware of the dangerous situation developing on the Chalcidides before Callias departed. He probably arranged that Callias should link up with Archistratus and then look to end hostilities with Perdiccas. The issue around Potidaea and Athens' interests in the region were probably far more pressing at this stage. We are not aware of the terms arranged with Perdiccas, but surprisingly, what was arranged had not angered their ally, Philip. By this stage, the situation for Athens was worsening at Potidaea for them with the arrival of Aristius's volunteer force. This development would see that the Athenians would get their forces on the move as soon as they could. This would see 3,000 Athenian hoplites, a number of allied troops, and 600 Macedonian cavalry, loyal to Philip, march south along the coastline towards Potidaea. Following this land army would also be the 70 Athenian triremes that had made up the two fleets. And as we can see, whatever took place at Pydna, Philip was still willing to support Athens with cavalry. Do you want more Casting Through Ancient Greece episodes? Well, I have some good news for you. If you have been enjoying the series and wish to support the show over at Patreon, you can gain access to many bonus episodes, with new ones being added each month. Not only will you be gaining more content, but you will be helping the series grow. These bonus episodes have been taking a deeper dive on subjects we have covered briefly in the series so far. We began at the start of the Greek timeline and have been moving forward, this seeing as having covered topics around prehistory, the Bronze Age, and the Archaic Age. We are now turning to focus on the Greek and Persian War period, with us beginning with the Ionian Revolt. Here we'll be putting in focus through different episodes the early contact between the Greeks and Persians, motivations behind the Ionian Revolt, the Persian counteroffensive of the revolt, and then a focus on the final battle of Lade. If you are interested in gaining access to these bonus episodes, please consider heading over to the Casting Through Ancient Greece Patreon page. Not only will you get monthly bonus episodes, but you will receive early access and ad-free series episodes. Other options also include access to fully referenced transcripts of the series episodes, as well as a forum where members' questions are answered every month via video. Alternatively, you can visit the Casting Through Ancient Greece website where you can find the Patreon link as well as other ways that help the series grow when clicking on the Support the Series button. Thank you all for listening to the series, and I look forward to perhaps seeing you over on Patreon. Back in Potidaea, arrangements were taking place to get ready for battle. 
no doubt word would have arrived that Athens was on the march. We would hear that Aristius would take command of the infantry forces, while Perdiccas would command the cavalry. If some sort of truce or peace was made with Perdiccas, it appears he quickly broke that by making his way back to Bodidia to assist the forces there. Thucydides says that Perdiccas had broken his alliance with the Athenians, though I do find it hard to believe Philip would be willing to lend forces to the Athenians if they had entered into an alliance with his enemy. By this stage, the Athenians were at the city of Giganus, just south of Potidaea, and the Potidaeans and their allies were preparing for battle. Aristius had stationed his infantry forces outside the city, to the north, still on the isthmus. His intention was to await the Athenians and not advance out into more open ground, out of the opening of the isthmus. Meanwhile, the Chalcidian allies, along with Perdiccas' cavalry, were located up in Olynthus, with them looking to move against the Athenian rear when they advanced onto Aristius' position. I know there are a lot of names of places and movements going on here, so I put up a map of the region so you can follow along with a bit more context of these places. It seems that the Athenians were fully aware of the positions of the enemy, as the Potidaean plan would not unfold as they wished. Callias had sent the Macedonian cavalry in the direction of Olynthus, where they would break up the opposing cavalry and other forces there, sending them back into the city. The Macedonian cavalry would then remain in the rear, where they would then prevent any further enemy interference from the direction of Olympus. With this done, the rest of the Athenian army would break camp and march onto Potidaea, now that their rear was secure. As they came in sight of the isthmus that Potidaea was located on, they could see the enemy preparing for battle. The Athenians likewise began to form their ranks ready for battle just outside the city, and it wasn't long after their arrival to where both sides would be engaged. Thucydides tells us that Aristius, commanding the Corinthian infantry and other picked troops, was able to defeat the wing that opposed him, where they would then pursue them for quite some distance. However, this would turn out to place them in a dangerous position, as the rest of the Potidaeans and Peloponnesians were defeated by the Athenians, and withdrew behind the walls of Potidaea. This would leave Aristius isolated, though his actions would seem to show that he was a competent leader. Thucydides says, Returning from the pursuit, Aristius perceived the defeat of the rest of the army. Being at a loss which of the two risks to choose, whether to go to Olynthus or to Potidaea, he at last determined to draw his men into as small a space as possible, and force his way with a run back to Potidaea. Not without difficulty, through a storm of missiles, he passed along by the breakwater and brought off most of his men safe, though a few were lost. This would see that the Athenians had been victorious in their first engagement, and would establish a trophy on the battlefield, which they held. However, the battle had not been without cost, the Athenians losing 150 of their citizens, with one of those being the commander, Callias. The Potidaeans would lose some 300 men, and having arranged a truce with the Athenians, were able to recover their dead. Although the Athenians had been victorious in the battle, the Potidaeans had not been broken and were still able to resist. Now being behind their walls, if Athens was going to attempt to win the war, they would need to have to engage in siege warfare, a much more time and resource consuming exercise. The Athenians would almost at once begin works on the walls of the city. However, their strength was only sufficient to be able to maintain the siege on the northern side of the city. No siege works were constructed on the southern walls at this early stage. News of the Battle of Potidaea and the subsequent siege had travelled back to Athens. This would result in the commitment to the Chalcidides now growing far beyond what was thought necessary to enforce their will around Potidaea. Heracles was now forced to send yet another Athenian force north to deal with the escalating situation. A further 1600 hoplites would arrive under the command of Pharmio, where they would focus on securing the southern walls and completing the encirclement of the city, with the ships of the fleet also blockading the city from the east and west. With the siege now in full effect around the city, Aristius saw that it would only be a matter of time before his forces would have to surrender. The only way to have a chance of holding out would be to reduce the number of mouths to feed, obtain more support from the Peloponnesians, and have an outside force harass the Athenians. Aristius would end up sneaking out of the city undetected by the Athenians, but would remain in the Chalcidides, where he would stir up support and see that the Athenians would have to worry about being attacked from other directions. He would also remain in contact with the Peloponnesians in an attempt to try and win more support for the city. Unfortunately for them, the Spartan support that had been promised earlier would not eventuate at this stage. These actions carried out by Aristius would see that the Athenians could not just stay focused on the walls of Potidaea. To combat the increasing raids on their positions, 
they would now have to divert forces to targeting the nearby villages and cities. This would see that the efforts around Potidaea would become protracted, and Athens now found itself committed to an enterprise they had not foreseen. They had nearly 5,000 hoplites committed to the area and many lighter troops, along with over 70 of their ships. This was also seeing relations between Athens and Corinth degenerating further. Although Corinth itself was not technically fighting Athens, Athenian and Corinthian interests were very much being fought over. The Thirty Years' Peace would still hold for the time being, because of Corinth's unofficial involvement. However, this state wouldn't last too much longer. Corinth was still pushing for intervention from the Peloponnesian League and getting Sparta involved. If they could achieve this, then this escalating but still contained conflict would explode into something much larger. However, this would not be the only action undertaken by Athens that would see a chance of war further increase with Sparta. Back on the mainland, around the same time of events as the Chalcidides, Athens would direct their focus diplomatically towards Megara, situated in a strategically important position at the opening of the Corinthian Isthmus, and also a member of the Peloponnesian League. We had seen that during the First Peloponnesian War, Megara had sought Athens' help in its conflict with Corinth. However, as the war developed and came to a close, Megara would once again move back into the Peloponnesian League. During this conflict, we had seen how beneficial control in Megara was for Athens, as it had given them access to both the Saronic Gulf as well as the Corinthian Gulf. Not only this, but it made an invasion coming out of the Peloponnese directed at Athens much more difficult. Now in 432, Megara was still part of the Peloponnesian League, and Athens did not exert the influence it had during the First Peloponnesian War, though both cities did have a trading relationship. It's at this stage, after the Battle of Sabota, and during the Athenian campaign directed at Potidaea, that Athens would enact economic sanctions on Megara, which would be known as the Megarian Decree. It must be noted here that there is some disagreement over when this decree was enacted, with some believing it had been in place much earlier, with the reasoning here being that Thucydides does not give it the same level of importance as the Potidaean affair, even though both would help explain the escalation of attentions within Greece. However, the flip side of the argument asks, if it had been enacted much earlier, why do we not hear about it from any other ancient historians before 432, as it would have been a very big deal and involved Athens. Anyway, I don't want to bog down too much in the arguments over this, but for the most part it is generally thought the decree would take place in 432. This decree effectively saw Megara was barred from using any marketplace or port within the Athenian Empire. This would have crippled Megara's economy since many of the cities and islands within the Athenian Empire had some of the richest trading connections. However, this would also have been a flow and effect that would see the allies of Megara, those in the Peloponnesian League, also affected. We will look a little closer at this aspect when trying to understand what Athens was trying to achieve, enacting these sanctions. There would be a number of reasons provided from different quarters for why Athens would put economic sanctions on Megara. Though the official reason for the action that Athens would provide would be due to Megara's trespass on land sacred to Hera, this being a plane known as the Hera Ogus. Though, like many have pointed out, the decree seems like an overreach for the action supposedly taken, as surely Pericles would have seen the ramifications of what these sanctions at a time when war with Sparta was as close as it had been since the First Peloponnesian War. This very point has led to scholars looking to other reasons of why these sanctions were put in place, with Donald Kagan outlining some of these. One looks to Pericles looking for a way to bring war on, as it seems as though it was inevitable anyway. The reasoning here was that Athens wanted a war to come while it was in an advantageous position to deal with it. While the decree would see that tensions would be inflamed, it also had the aim of isolating Megara economically, to where hopefully they would look to leave the Peloponnesian League and come over to Athens. This would see Athens having control in the region as war would break out and be in an even better defensive position against Sparta. However, this theory does not have many supporters, as if this was the reason it completely failed, with it having to rely on too many variables that Athens had no control over, while in hindsight the degree would be shown to stiffen Megara's resolve. Another reason looks to explain the action as mostly psychological, with Pericles wanted to show the Peloponnesians he was not fearful of them. Perhaps this could even feed into some sort of deterrence action, with Athens displaying an aggressively confident posture to make their enemies think twice about going to war with them. The other reasons highlighted pretty much become varying degrees of these two general points, 
with some pushing more in the seeking war direction, to others pushing in the attempting to gain strategic advantage region. However, they all pretty much rest with the idea that Pericles knew war was coming. However, Kagan also provides a reasoning to the decree if we can assume Pericles was trying to avoid war with Sparta and not actually bring it on. He argues that it stems back to the actions around Corsara when Megara would not come to support Corinth. Although at the time of this initial engagement, Athens was not involved, they would end up becoming an ally of Corsara and would end up seeing combat against the Corinthian force that included Megara. This then put Athens in a tough position. If they failed to take action against Corinth and its allies, then this could well encourage more of the Peloponnesian cities to join in the next time. Remember, during these encounters Sparta had seemed to avoid hostility and presumably put pressure on others in the League to do the same. This saw two policies develop within the Peloponnesian League, Sparta's one of restraint and Corinth's aggressive one. If Corinth were able to gather more and more support, this then may have made it more difficult for Sparta to stay out of matters. So Pericles may have been attempting to target those who were openly hostile towards Athens to deter further actions, while also leaving Sparta alone and those who had not taken part. The decree was taking somewhat of a middle ground between doing nothing or attacking Megara directly. As Kagan puts it, the policy to be followed should hurt the Megarians and teach them and the other potential enemies how costly such enmity must be. At the same time, however, it must not include a technical breach of the Thirty Years' Peace or any other situation that would force Sparta to fight. The Megarian decree seems an admirable compromise. The other thing we need to keep in mind here is that Pericles had been in political life for quite some time now. While he had also built up friendships with influential figures in Sparta, such as King Archidamus. Keeping in mind Cimon's reasoning for naming his son Lacedaemonius, we hear of Spartans with names that show favour towards Athens. These would be Periclides, who had come to Athens seeking their aid during the Helot Revolt, while Athenius, thought to be Periclides' son, would lead the embassy that would sign the first peace of the Peloponnesian War that we have yet to get to. All of these figures seem to have a connection to the peace party in Sparta, and one would think would provide a reliable conduit for Pericles to understand as best he could the feelings in Sparta, while developing his own policy. In other words, he wasn't just stabbing in the dark at the geopolitical situation, he would have been acting with good understanding of Sparta's intentions and the policies being debated there. The Megarian degree and the Potidean affair would be the two most significant events that would lead to war finally breaking out in Greece between the Spartans, Peloponnesian League and the Athenian Empire. However, these actions cannot be viewed in isolation in understanding how war would come about. As we started off with this episode, Athens would prepare itself for continued conflict with Corinth, but it is far from certain if the feelings of the time saw war with Sparta as inevitable. Reading Thucydides' account, you can easily walk away with that interpretation, though the debates that would take place would see that war was still up in the air until the final moment. There would also be a number of minor actions that Athens would take part in to strengthen their position that we did not cover, but no doubt they would have been factored in with these larger policies being enacted. Before the Athenian general Formio was sent on his mission to reinforce the Athenians in the Chalcidides, he had been sent on a mission to the Ambracian coast, where Corinthian influence was expelled from the city of Acania, which had entered during the Corinthians' campaigns around Cosara. This Athenian action was successful and would see Athens gain a firm ally on the west coast that was in a position to trouble the Corinthians in that region. We would also hear during this time that Athens would send a fleet to Naples, who had appealed for aid. We don't know much else about this expedition, but it is thought Athens had the intention of gaining allies in the west, around Italy, or at least reinserting their influence to some degree in the region. This would also be seen as a measure to combat Corinth, who had interests west, while it is also thought that further Athenian expeditions took place at the time of the events around Corsara, while the Athenians were in the region. My current inclination is to see the actions undertaken by Athens as an attempt at strengthening themselves in the face of this developing conflict with Corinth. They could not stand by and allow hostile actions to go unpunished, this leaving aside who was acting in the right over these matters. It appears the actions they did engage in, they were making a conscious effort to avoid targeting Sparta directly and breaching the Thirty Years' Peace they had with them. Perhaps at the time of Sabota, Sparta was willing to give benefit of the doubt for the sake of peace. However, I am always open to re-evaluating these views as I learn more and look at the issue from other angles. 
However, we like to interpret a complex situation in a time where we don't have available all the information we would like. Everything we have covered appears to be part of Pericles' policy to ensure Athens was ready for war. But was this just with the Corinthians in mind, or were they looking at something much larger? The initial actions give the impression Corinth was in the forefront of their minds, since there was restraint in their actions when looking at Sparta in the equation. However, Athenian actions would see that Corinth and their allies would begin pushing harder and harder to drag Sparta into the conflict. Each Athenian action allowing Corinth to twist it to strengthen their arguments. No matter Pericles' intention with what took place, if Corinth could successfully convince Sparta Athens had breached the peace, the offending action would then prove to be a mistake on the overall policy. It's this effort Corinth would make to bring Sparta into the conflict we will turn to next episode. Thank you everyone for your continued support and a big shout out to all those who have found some value in the series and have been supporting you on Patreon and other various ways. Your contribution has truly helped me grow the series. If you've also found some value in the show and wish to support the series, you can head to www.castingthroughancientgreece.com and click on the support the series button where you can discover many ways to extend your support to helping the series grow. Be sure to stay connected and updated on what's happening in the series and join me over on Facebook or Instagram at Casting Through Ancient Greece or on Twitter at Casting Greece. And be sure to subscribe to the series over at the Casting Through Ancient Greece website. I hope you can join me next time where we continue the narrative in the series with episode 71, The Decision.